Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, good evening and welcome, and I'm so glad you're here with us. Uh, we hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy and getting lots of doses of nature where you can. It is a delight to see our current members and our volunteers gathered together. Um, your commitment to the museum and your support of the museum is deeply appreciated and absolutely vital to our ability to advance our mission and thrive during the shutdown. And, and, and which is surely one of the darkest periods in our nearly 100, 150 year history. I never imagined when I started at the museum four and a half years ago that I'd be introducing talks from my dining room or leading a staff working out of homes, but uh, it, has been, it has not been all bad. And tonight I'm gonna share a little bit about what, uh, what we've been up to and about working for, what working from home has, has been like. We've learned a lot over the past 10 months and this experience is definitely making us stronger and more nimble as a museum. After the talk, we'll open it up for questions, but I'm gonna start by answering the first question right now, which is we don't know <laughs> when we can reopen. Uh, we'll, I'll talk later in the talk. We are making plans to possibly be able to open in April, but uh, it's anyone's guess whether that will come to pass. It's, it's well out of our hands. This is a, a state uh, issue. So tomorrow is Charles Darwin's birthday. He would be uh, 212 years old. And uh, just to set it in time, The Origin of Species was published only 15 years before the San Diego Society of Natural History was founded. Um, and this adapt, evolve, and, and thrive is, is, is sort of an apt way to start the talk because uh, the American Association uh, Alliance of Museums is predicting that somewhere between a quarter and a third of museums nationwide will not make it out of the pandemic. Um, we are, I, I believe, uh, exceptional in that we are not only going to survive um, thanks to everyone's help, but we are also getting a tremendous amount of really interesting work done. So we'll take a, a, a trip down memory lane here. Uh, this is a photo of our last staff meeting when we were announcing that we were it was time to close to the public. And uh, you can see this is the period when we all thought we could just wash our hands like mad for a few weeks and we'd be back in business. Uh, there's no mask in sight here. We closed our doors to the public on March 15th. This is literally the last group leaving and security locking up. And uh, these guys actually purchased a membership, <laughs> act of faith. We were allowed to reopen by the state in July. And so this is a photo during the four day period that we were open. And you can see we have installed lots of safety measures and you can't see all the hand washing stations but we took a lot of the touchable items off of the floor and really went to quite a bit of trouble to get ready to open and uh, we had some really happy people, maybe some of you on the call, came to see us during that very, very short period. But we closed again on July 5th because of a state mandate and we have not reopened since. And I, the decision uh, that we made in the summer to stay closed until the end of the calendar year, I still feel was a really good decision. We, were, we had a very short period in the fall when San Diego was in the purple zone and, and able to open indoor venues. But we were concerned both about safety and we also realized that this would be an incredible period to get a tremendous amount of work done behind the scenes. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight is, is how we made best use of, of that time. And we did get some even national news coverage for having, having made that decision. Back in April or May, when we really did think this would be over in, in a matter of months, uh, I was, and we were a little more clueless and optimistic. Um, I was working alone in my, in my dining room right here and um, thinking about, well, how can we, what do we wanna look like when we pull out of the pandemic and how can we make the best use of, of this time? 
it, it is incredibly disruptive to work in a closed museum. I have experience with that from my time at the Smithsonian, and I know that there's a lot that can happen while you're closed that can't have possibly you have time to do when, when you're open. And so I've issued a manifesto from my, from my home about uh, thinking about how this crisis can help us reframe our model for the museum, which was pretty much based on uh, we open the doors and people come visit. And so the manifesto uh, that, that uh, worked on and circulated to the staff and the board talks about trying to create a sort of three three legged stool that includes on site but also puts effort into online uh, activities and in nature and na activities in nature. We are a natural history museum and so that is a, a really interesting and rich third uh, type of, of uh, activity that we could that we could investigate. And the manifesto actually had a list, a plan for how to get started. And if any of the staff, I know we have a few staff on this call, you look down this list, we have made progress on every single bullet here, which is pretty amazing. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to walk through these all I will actually talk about about several of them. But really, um, I'm very, it's very gratifying as a leader, not only to be listened to, but to see the way the staff absolutely ran with this opportunity. I have a mentor who said to me very early in the pandemic, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And I feel like we have, have made the absolutely the most of that. So we're going to walk through some of the, some of the uh, accomplishments of this period. And um, I, I will reiterate, we are planning to be able to open April 1st if we learn from the state that, uh, that this is permissible, but it will take us a few weeks to ramp up. So anytime San Diego hits the, the red zone from the purple zone, from the purple zone um, we will need a few weeks to ramp up before, before we reopen, but we are we are fervently hoping that we will be able to open at some point in the spring, although not feeling that's 100% realistic. Um, so it was pretty amazing how quickly everybody was able to adapt to working at home. We have our paleontologist, Chris Plouffe over here on the left who set up in his living room, I, I love I love this picture of, of Ashley, our Ashton, our, our educator, teaching a class with her son and dog uh, looking on. And it only took us about a week to get everybody up and running in their homes. Out in the field, we had a real breakthrough with our red-legged frog project. And just as everything was closing down in March, uh, we our scientists reached the critical mass of, of eggs of the California red-legged frog in Baja, California, and had all the permits to translocate them from Baja into two sites in Southern California. And so as everything's closing down, including the border, um, on March 14th, we did the first translocation of, of red-legged frogs and one of the reintroduction sites was successful um, and there are froglets hopping around. And then just last week, our scientists had three more translocations of eggs. So we have reintroduced red-legged frogs into two sites in, in Southern California with a lot of hope for, for some significant success. We um, have had to adapt all of our projects and the LEPNET project was, is one of the, the sort of more interesting examples. It's a massive effort to scan and digitally catalog our Lepidoptera, which is our butterfly and, and moth collection. And they had to quickly switch to incorporate remote volunteers uh, when the building closed. The team had virtual volunteers uh, in, from across the United States and Canada that were transcribing photo, transcribing information in images, but we still needed people to, to work on 
on it locally. And so they were handing off drawers of, of insects in the on park out on park boulevard to try to get the volunteers get things out of the building to the volunteers they would bring them back and and we were um, cataloging through there it was our own version of the restaurant sidewalk pickup but that project has has moved forward and is really it is really making great strides our scientists also wrapped up long-term studies at camp pendleton We've had 12 years of botanical monitoring and five years of entomological studies there. And these were the first of their kind for the base and resulted in the discovery of species previously unknown to science um, and also the discovery of invasive species that have been um, working on, on eradication that were not previously known from the region. So that we wrapped up that uh, more than decade of, of studies there. And then uh, those of you who know John Redmond knows he, you know, he's irrepressible and, and also a, a, a fan of being in the field. So when he was stuck here, he turned to our collections to try to discover new species. And indeed, he found, um, he was working on in specimens uh, from Baja, California that, and discovered a collection that was incorrectly identified as Ancelia palmeri from the Vizcaino Desert and, and decided that it, it is apparently a completely new and undescribed species in another geni genus. And there was only one specimen in the herbarium with this, uh, of this mix mystery taxon, but it appears to be a very attractive shrub with silvery leaves and brown and yellow flowering heads that grows in sandy areas. So. Um, he's itching to get down to Baja when he can to, um, to, to see if he can uh, find the species in, in the wild. But so even, even in a shutdown when, uh, when we can't get in the field, there's a lot of work that can be done right inside the museum's walls. We also had some exciting discoveries in the, in the paleo realm, uh, an unusual fossil deposit containing skeletal remains of extinct mammals, including camels, oreodonts, rodents, and possibly a large car carnivore, was found by our paleo team on a new construction site near Otay Mesa. And the project is a joint venture between Caltrans and, the Sand and Sandag, and it's going to be part of a new 21st century border crossing. And uh, appears to have some very, very significant finds in it. And so this was going on. You can see what field work was like in the heat with masks um, in Nero Tai Mesa. In terms of thinking about moving online, we, as many of you know, we moved our Nat Talks onto Zoom and attendance for our talk, our evening talks regularly fills or exceeds what, what would be capacity in our 300 seat theater in the museum. We've produced twice as many programs as we usually do. And although they're offered at no cost, the voluntary donations are helping us meet our budget go goals for this program. And the digital format has allowed us to bring in speakers from all over the world We've had, we have had speakers as far away as Australia and our audience has ranged as far afield as Argentina and England. And we've also opened up our lunchtime seminars to a wider audience by streaming them live on Facebook. The digital format has allowed us to discuss current natural history events and experiment with formats. We've had our first uh, Spanish language Nat Talks that feature our partners and scientific colleagues. And I wanted to highlight that our next talk, uh, which is next Tuesday, is by Luis Mata, who will be uh, seeing us from Australia, uh, talking about bringing nature back into cities. He's an excellent speaker, and uh, his, his studies are showing that patches of habitat about the size of my desk uh, can help support uh, native bees. And so it's a really, really interesting and uplifting story about wildlife in cities. We've also 
put a tremendous amount of effort toward distance learning because our students, which are a tremendous uh, piece of our audience and one of the reasons we uh, exist is for education and, and our students are no longer able to come to us. And so we, we have figured out ways to take our programming to them digitally. And we've created a, a select but wonderful and growing library of online curricula and classes and activities. Uh, we've been able to do exhibition tours and preschool story time programs, lessons, uh, interviews with our scientists. One of the things to, that's most exciting to me is that we are able to introduce students to our scientists. We've been able to take them out into the field or into the collections. It's the kind of activities that they can't do with 300 kids visiting uh, during the day. So we're, we're trying to make really good use of the digital media by taking students to places and having them meet people they couldn't ordinarily uh, interact with. And we're doing live programming that's timed for during school and after school hours. And we're already seeing the results of, of our efforts. Our education pages have been viewed more than 19,000 times in the past six months, which is an increase of, of nearly 40% over the, over the last year. And that's, that is just growing. So we're very, very excited about that. And uh, new, new offerings are coming on every month. Another, another new effort for us is our e-commerce. We launched a, an e-commerce uh, port icon on our website. And what we're doing is we're able to take the stunning images from our library, the Valentine prints and, and some of the images from rare books and offer them on products. It's, a lot of it is uh, print on demand technology. And there are some really, really wonderful pieces in the collection, which is also growing. And I, I suggest if you're, if you're interested in, in our rare book images at, or Valentine prints, that you, you check it out at the, at the uh, URL there. We're also, we're also busy getting ready for the moment at which we are able to open. And we have a new exhibition that is installed and, and ready to go on the fourth floor of the museum, California Blooming, which is looking at wildflowers and climate change. And these are exquisite photos of, of California wildflowers and uh, information on how climate change is affecting them. And I think we have a few more uh, examples of these photos. It will, it, this is an absolutely stunning exhibition and it has landscapes and then they've done all these incredible close-ups and it's a husband and wife team and these are photos that are taken in situ in the wild. So we have some pictures of them on their bellies and trying to set up all of these shots and so this will be this will be um, fun to see. It will open the moment our doors reopen whenever that is. We're also working on new exhibitions for the future as well. And this is a new gallery that we are putting in on the fourth floor of the museum. For those of you who are familiar with the museum, if you come up the stairs and this area was previously offices and the pandemic has shown us that we don't need maybe quite as many offices as we had. And, and we had some funding set aside for an exhibition on the Baja California Peninsula. And we decided that this would be the time to get the gallery uh, underway. And we are, are we ever glad we did that. It is so disruptive to have the, to have the um, construction. And here you can see what the what the gallery is going to look like it's it's going to be absolutely lovely with the with the greenhouse windows and and it's 2000 square feet oriented north south and so the exhibition itself will be a walk through the Baja Peninsula from the uh, let's see if I get this right this is oriented 
north is north is here and south is there. But it will be the other way around when you come up the stairs. The other thing we're planning that we're very excited about, the, the sort of third leg of our school about, about um, having more nature-based activities is we are working on a plan for interpretive gardens around the outside of the building. We have 22,000 22, square feet when you look at the green areas inside, inside the walkways. And although it is not part of our lease for the building, we are working with the city and Friends of Balboa Park and the Conservancy about trying to use the Adopt-A-Plot program to adopt and, and care for all of these spaces that but would allow us to have interpretive gardens. It, the goal here is to provide uh, educational amenity, both for classes and visitors to the museum, but also for anybody walking through the park and to, to, and to have some more, more natural history right outside of our doors. So this is an example of the South East corner of the building, and we're here. We're, we're proposing a pollinator garden, and I believe the next slide sh so shows how this is a, a shot from above, looking at at the museum and our relationship both to Florida Canyon, to the lovely gardens, the the rose garden and the cactus garden across the way, and the sort of formal plantings along along the Prado. And, and positing that we would love to be able to put some natural history and some interpretation about natural history just around the, just around the perimeter of the building. And the plan is not quite ready for, for distribution. We're still uh, in discussions with the city about it, uh, but this shows a before shot from the little garden at the, northeast corner of the of the fig tree lawn the fig tree would be that way and and one of so one of the things we're proposing is a little discovery trail that would lead from this garden to our doors and provide a little bit of a natural history experience on the walkway over there but uh, we're very excited about that and hoping that that we will get approval and be able to uh, plan this in earnest And, and sticking with the um, outdoor theme, we are also really thrilled that we were able to um, have our canyoneers, instead of being able to guide hikes on their own, they are curating hikes online and these, and, and they've also been a huge contributor to our social media traffic Social media has kept our digital doors wide open while our physical doors are closed. And um, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube experienced a growth in followers and average engagement increased 90% over the last year. So with, uh, with the um, Canyoneers, it was the, I believe the day we launched the top hikes for the fall, we experienced the largest single day uh, page views to the website in nearly three years. So I think people were starved for uh, some information about how to get outside and get out of their houses and get some, get some uh, exercise. And keep, keep an eye out for um, great, 10 great hikes for, for spring and, and summer. We've also been working hard on a uh, on a quest to save energy. That is one of the one of the hallmarks of our long term planning is to try to reduce our our own carbon footprint. And we have a building that is is really energy intensive, and so we've been taking steps during the pandemic and, and beyond planning for how we are going to reduce our, our energy, our carbon footprint. And one of the major advances was last spring, we were able to change our, our uh, heating and air conditioning unit. And you can see the old, I love this old behemoth coming down and this is the snazzy new one. And I was standing there on the sidewalk with our staff thinking, 
30 years from now, somebody's going to be looking at this one and saying, oh my God, look at that big, look at that big ugly honking thing when uh, the new unit the size of a suitcase gets hoisted up to the, up to the roof. But um, this is considerably smaller. It is um, a lot more efficient and smart. But um, so we've in installed two new um, HVAC units this summer. We've replaced um, the filters in all of our air conditioning units, and we are well on our way to uh, upgrading all of our light bulbs and other other uh, energy intensive uses of the building. So we have been really glad to have been able to save energy uh, um, tremendously during the during the pandemic, and we're hoping that we can that we can sustain that as well. And when you look at the full scope of what we accomplished, it would make anyone proud um, during normal times, but during a pandemic with severely reduced resources, uh, a pall of uncertainty and, and health concerns hanging over everyone. And I know a lot of our staff were um, trying to get their work done with kids at home and um, it wasn't it wasn't an easy it wasn't an easy work situation for anyone so when you take all that into consideration I think what I showed you is is truly astounding and I wanted to to make it clear that all of you all of our supporters um, really share credit um, in for our success and we we deeply appreciate it We had a bonus video that we were going to show of, of working at home, and I can also take questions. The idea was you can put your questions in the Q&A, and let's check and see if we have questions or, oop, let's see if I go back. There we go. See what my, see what my, uh, all right, no questions yet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to show the to show this video. We wanted to we wanted to show you what it was like working at home, and we talked some of our staff into into providing tours for us. So that's what I'm gonna see if I can stop my share and it's just gonna take me a sec to get the video up. Hopefully this isn't too awkward. There we go. And can you all sh see? No, there we go. Is that showing? Can somebody tell me? Yes, okay. So here we have a tour for those of you who are familiar with Michael and maybe have seen him in his in his crazy Zoom background. Here he's providing us a tour of, of what his workspace has looked like during the pandemic. Hey everybody, it's Michael Wall here, curator of entomology and a previously recorded message of uh, what life is like uh, in my pandemic workspace, which is my garage, as you can see around me. Um, but more specifically, I do an awful lot of work at this desk that has been here since before the pandemic, um, but uh, made a few mods to it in order to make it a little bit more workable for me. Added another monitor, put that shelf in so that I have this sweeping array of desk space that you can see in front of me. Also brought a microscope in from work and also brought some specimens in from work because not having access to the collection is a bummer. Uh, so what I did is when I'm working on a specific group, I'll sometimes bring like what we call is like a sort of a synoptic collection in. And so right now I'm working on stink beetles in this genus called Eusatis. Um, and so I brought in one of sort of every species from the collection to be as a reference collection while I try to identify these beetles um, that are from a variety of places, including 
uh, the Gulf Islands from an expedition we did in November of 2018, and also from the sand dunes down in Baja, California, where I've been working with colleagues for the past year. And so lots of lots of samples here. That stuff's from the Gulf Islands. This stuff is from the dunes that a wonderful volunteer named Fran has uh, been sorting to what we call morpho species for me. So what she is doing is going through samples that are bulk samples from traps and they've got lots of different species in them and she is sorting them to what she thinks are different species. She's not trying to put a name on it necessarily. Um, she's just going, yeah, that looks different and sorting it out, giving it the right labels. And then I come in later, get in focus there and try to put a name on it. So this is one that I've already identified. And I do that with my handy dandy microscope and by using lots of keys. So taxonomic keys, this is what I use the most these days because I'm working a lot on beetles. It's kind of the big book of beetles. Once you get something down to family, you can run it through a key in here and try to get it down to genus. Then once I get it down to genus, I find out more about that genus. Go like, okay, well this one has 13 species. There's what its distribution is. And oftentimes from there, it's like a little red trail crumbs that um, I'll try to find out what exact species it is and so forth. Last night I started working on this little guy that you can see out of there, kind of a little bit more in focus now. Um, that is from a dune system around San Quentin called the Socorro Dunes. Really not necessarily easy to see unless you're looking at it through a microscope, which is why I've got a microscope here. But um, turns out it is a species, um, it's related to scarab beetles. And I was able to get it keyed out. And then I, of course, went on ye old computer and found that someone had revised the group uh, not too long ago. So I know Guy Hanley, and I'm going to be reaching out to him and seeing if he can help me identify this thing. Because even though he's revised it and written really good key for it, um, I can't key it out. <laughs> so it's either something new or, or something interesting at least, because I, I know um, from looking through Guy's uh, key that uh, it's not been previously recorded from the area of the peninsula that I've been working in. So it's an interesting workspace. Um, got my Moravian star up there, old tradition from my family during the holidays. You know, it's a mixture of my uh, tool area, my bookshelf of references that I use a lot, and specimens, treadmill, a little bit of workout equipment, trying to stay healthy during a pandemic groceries, a little bit of beer over there. And I would say the best thing about working in my garage is that it's okay for me to make the floor real dirty. I can actually just pour waste ethanol onto the floor and it'll dry up real quick. Wouldn't do that in the museum. Uh, and probably the worst thing about my pandemic workspace, even though I've got somewhat of a view out here, is that when it's cold outside, it can be pretty dark and dismal in here. Uh, and it's not well insulated, but I do have a little, little space heater down there to keep me cozy on those extra cold days. But I'll also wear a hat and all that sort of stuff to stay warm too. During the summer, it gets mighty roasty toasty in my garage, but that's okay. I'm all right with that. In any case, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, impromptu uh, tour of my pandemic workspace and thank you all for your support of the museum your membership your volunteership all those things are incredibly important to keep us healthy as an organization through the pandemic and i think we're doing really good work i hope you're proud of us because uh, we certainly are really pleased with what we've been able to accomplish over the last year so thank you So that was, uh, oops, my video back on. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was 
we've all been curious about Michael's workspace. So uh, it was it was a real treat for his colleagues to be able to, to see all the various parts of his garage. So I see um, a couple of questions and I, uh, Mick Hager at the top. <laughs> Thanks, Mick. What is planned for the 150th anniversary in three years? Well, um, we have we have big ideas uh, as as uh, Mick points out, the 150th anniversary is in 2024. Mm -hmm. And we had, we were on a roll getting ready for that. And uh, when the pandemic hit, we decided that we had to um, back off a bit, but we used that time as you can see to do studies and to, and to understand what it would take to, to do things like look try to put plantings around the outside of the building try to try to uh, build new galleries and so our plan is to come up with a list of projects that we want to accomplish in the building everything from energy savings projects to things that'll that will uh, benefit visitors and and things that will help stabilize the finances of the museum for a good long time and uh, more to come on that. We hope to start talking with uh, with people about what what we'd like to do in the next in the next year or so. But stay tuned, and we guarantee there will be a big party by then. Hopefully, we can be in person. Rebecca asks, "How many staff and scientists do we have working in the field at any given time?" and uh, I am not 100% sure about that, about that uh, answer. I know our paleo, our paleo crews are out every single day and many of our scientists are. I would say, see if any of my, um, my colleagues behind the scenes have answers, uh, answers to that or Rebecca, it is, it's probably on the order of 20 people is my guess at any given time and that and that the um, the field season for biology really starts cranking up in March that's when we never see our colleagues because they're all out and and we definitely staff up at that point so it's it is it is uh, seasonal and when I when I started at the museum they I had a lovely welcome party for me and I got to meet all the staff and it was a rainy day and about half the people I met said they worked in the paleontology department. I could not figure out what was going on. And it was all of our field monitors were in for the day because of the rain and, and because of the party. So we, we do have a lot of people normally not in the museum. We also have a, a question about whether the um, financial model has changed over the last year and how, and yes, it has. We were very fortunate to get um, uh, PPP funds from the Small Business Administration. We, we got a, a forgivable loan in the first draw and we just this week got the second draw PPP loan, which we hope will also be forgiven. And that has been a tremendous boon, but I think equal to that has been the philanthropy and we, the challenge grant that we had last summer and all of you who renew your membership and at, at every single level, have been, everyone has stepped up and, and been incredibly helpful. So it's, um, that, has, that has been instrumental to our, to our survival. The first thing we did was was uh, really cut back as much as we could on our spending. And so, and, and we were just remarking the other day that we haven't bought office supplies. We're not using paper. It was a lot because we're not in the building. We, we, have, we have changed a lot of our spending patterns as well. And we, we try to uh, operate the building hours so that we don't have to run the air conditioning for as many hours and things like that. Are there plans for the basement space, Peter asks. Yes, there are. And I'm very excited about that. We have a study going right now with, a, um, with an architecture firm and our staff 
to look at that LB space, which we have used for, um, we've used for special exhibitions, we've used it for events, and we are doing a study now to see if we can move out of our warehouse in National City, which is where part of our paleontology collection is stored, and a lot of a lot of just general storage for the museum is down there. And it appears that we could possibly, and this is not a promise to anyone, but we could possibly move out of that warehouse and have visible storage for our paleontology collection, move our demo lab down there and have a small exhibit space as well. And if we were able to do that, we could have exhibit galleries on every single floor of the museum because we now have our, our new beautiful um, gallery underway for the fourth floor. Um, John is asking how the, oh, this is John the scorpion guy asking how the live exhibit uh, animals are doing during this time. They are doing okay. I understand the beehive is, it needs to be replaced. I think the bees um, exited, but, and we, we plan to bring them back before we open, but we have had our animal care people are, are in on a daily basis. And that has always been a major consideration of ours that we're taking good care of our, of our live animals. And uh, I, I think some of them really miss having having visitors around and they will be thrilled when when we reopen. Um, Valerie's asking what are other ways we can provide support in addition to the financial support? Wow, that's a wonderful question. I think um, we always love our we love our volunteers and we have been doing our our very best to keep to keep everybody occupied and, and working with us during this period. Uh, when we reopen, we will have uh, we will have other other volunteer opportunities. And I think um, talking us up to your friends and and being a being an ambassador for the museum, that's uh, is incredibly important. Just we hope that we are a an important part of the community here in San Diego and so having having our members out there talking about the museum keeping uh spreading the word about the work we're doing is is also extremely helpful Stephania is asking what's a story I want to share that we haven't been able to tell yet oh my goodness I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to uh think about that there's been a lot a lot going on and a lot of really interesting um interesting things happening we uh, i think at the very very beginning of the of the program before everybody was logged in i was mentioning if you haven't heard the national public radio all things considered story that uh was that ran so yesterday or the day before on uh, paleontology that was that was absolutely a thrill and uh, an eight-year-old boy wrote to all things considered and said that they didn't have enough enough uh, material on dinosaurs and so they had him interview Ashley Poost who is our our postdoctoral paleontologist and and he was interviewed on the radio it's a short segment and just totally delightful and and so that that has been absolutely great i think for me um, professionally one of the most interesting one of the most interesting um, aspects of the pandemic is that my colleagues around the country and actually around the world have been really reaching out and helping each other. Museums are, are sharing information. We are able to um, compare notes and help each other with, with lots of different issues. And I think this has opened up lines of communication that didn't exist before. We were all very inward focused and just trying to get our work done. And now I think we, we are, um, working a lot more effectively with other museums. We're also uh, in a loose consortium with uh, 
LA County and Nat Natural History Museum and the Cal Academy up in uh, San Francisco to talk about if there are joint projects we can work on. So I think we're I think we're going to see an interesting period uh, in the in after the pandemic with museums working together on projects. And I think collaboration is really the the wave of the future for us all anyway. So I don't see any more questions. Oh, there's one. Are there any of those joint projects you can tell us about? <laughs> well, we're right now, um, we're, we're sharing information. We're looking at whether there is a way to combine information from all the different natural history collections to provide a picture of what California did look like uh, as, as we're reaching a period of, of climate change and, and, and worried about mitigation. And so we have the ecological record for this part of California and, and heading north, the other museums hold their records. And so together we have a, a, a pretty amazing picture and and uh, we're trying to figure out how we can how we can work with that. <laughs> Charles Clark asks to remind the volunteers to post their hours. Well, I'm happy to do that. Well, I thank you all for for coming tonight and um, happy to answer questions any other time as well. And I want to encourage you to join us again next Tuesday night for the for the Nat Talk that Luis Mata is doing. And we also, our Friday seminar series has also been quite interesting. So uh, if you are, uh, especially our, our volunteers and our members who are missing the, the natural history, you can, you can certainly find it online through that. And we will let you know as soon as we are ready to announce an, an opening date. So with that, thank you again for, oh, we have a member meetup on February 19th with Scott Tremor. Our, our mammologist, and he is absolutely wonderful, tells wonderful stories. So 16th and the 19th, we have two things happening uh, for you next week. We look forward to welcoming you back for our next online uh, meeting. And thank you again for joining us and for your commitment to the museum. As Michael put it so beautifully, uh, you, are, you are such an important support for us. And it's really, it's really helped us uh, buoy our spirits and also help us get our work done so to know that our that our members and volunteers are out there. So stay safe and we hope to see you in person sometime soon. <laughs>